Imagine, a regular lively podcast featuring discussions with the foremost explorers at the intersection of technology and the academic humanities to explore questions around tools, methods, and values. It's not what you're thinking, it's the Price Lab podcast, a production of the Price Lab for the Digital Humanities at the University of Pennsylvania. Welcome to Augmented Humanity. Our guests are modern explorers working at the intersection of technology and the humanities. They help us to understand ourselves and the worlds we create in this digital age. They are thinkers, creators, makers, and academics working in diverse fields like linguistics, technology, game and object design, and ethics. I'm your host, Craig Goldsmith. I'm your host, Ellen Dornan. On this program, we're talking with Julie Napolin, who helped create the Price Lab podcast and by Sarah Milinski, the Price Lab program manager and podcast producer. Price Lab podcast is a series focused on the people who are building, using, and critiquing the digital tools and techniques that are transforming the humanities in the 21st century. Thank you both so much for taking time out of your busy schedules today to talk with us. I just sort of wanted to start by talking a little bit about what Price Lab is and why Price Lab decided to start a podcast. The Price Lab is part of the School of Arts and Sciences at the University of Pennsylvania's Strategic Initiative for Humanities in the Digital Age. So what that means effectively is that the Price Lab supports innovative uses of technology in the study of history, art, and culture. So we're working directly both with scholars at the university as well as students and classes promoting the concept of digital humanities, which is really an umbrella term for any kind of humanities that wants to engage digital technology in the practice and research or to think critically about digital humanities. Sarah, just out of curiosity, why is the Price Lab called Price Lab? It's not because we're playing Name That Price. No, it's not, actually. So we were established in 2015 with a very generous gift from Michael and Vicki Price, which is where we got our name. So did you start the podcast right when the Price Lab was established? No, we didn't, actually seems to me that the podcast coincided with my time at the Price Lab. And I think because there was a gathering of people and a gathering of energies in the Price Lab in that moment of people who were really interested in sound. And we had one scholar who was working in the history of machine listening. And we had another scholar who was interested in poetics and sound at Penn, there's also Penn Sound. But, you know, there was just this matrix of sound stuff happening. And then Sarah has this background in documentary, and I wanted to teach my podcasting class. So there was this kind of gathering of forces around documentary, podcasting, oral history, sound, and then all these people were there. And it was like, hey, let's do something. It sounds like you have a lot of things going on there because you can have student involvement and you have staff and faculty involvement and all this. Is this also part of an outreach evangelizing or educating the larger world on the concept of the digital humanities? There's two parts to this that I feel I can speak to. One is that we have a weekly or a bi-weekly seminar where we have research fellows who join us as part of the Price Lab, and we also have outside guest speakers who come and speak at this research seminar. And it's lovely. You know, it's like a really lovely gathering of minds, and it's something that we usually organize around a loose topic. However, one thing that Stuart Varner, the managing director, Jim English, the director of Price Lab, and myself, we've talked about in the past is that it can feel a bit insular and it's not readily accessible to folks outside of Penn. So a lot of people can't just drop what they're doing and come to like a midday lunch seminar on Monday at Penn. So one of the reasons for the podcast is we were hoping to make humanities research more accessible that it would be available to people beyond Penn and available to people who can't join us at that very specific time and place. 
And I guess in regards to sharing information about the humanities, it's really kind of about sharing what the Price Lab's vision of digital humanities is. You know, we want to kind of say DH digital humanities really can be defined many different ways. It's a very big umbrella, but we did want to make clear how we define it in so much as foregrounding scholars and projects who promote underrepresented voices and people who bring a really critical framework to the DH sphere. So Julie, you're more the academic side of it, and Sarah, you're more the practical side of it. Am I understanding that correctly? Julie is an academic, yes, and <laughs> she is an expert in her field. So yeah, I think that's fair to say. I am a program manager, so I work really mostly in admin, and this is sort of like a passion project that, as Julie mentioned, it was this really special confluence of people and ideas and kind of desires that came together, and that really dovetailed perfectly with our desire to share what was happening at the seminar with a wider audience. And I think Julie, not only as an academic, not only as a fellow in our seminar, she also really mentored both myself and some other students who ended up working on the podcast as well. So I feel like it was a really lovely way to kind of ease into the medium, if you will. <laughs> yeah, I'm an academic, but I have a background in radio that's kind of been dormant, except for in my teaching. So I would still call it radio, but I hadn't made any radio in a number of years outside of my own teaching. So this was a really exciting opportunity for me to get back into the practical dimension of it. One of the things about the audio format is that people that might not be comfortable being videotaped or whatever are okay with just their voices going out just from a comfort level or from being self-conscious. And just as a quick note to that, we have speakers who come by and who have joined us for the podcast. And sometimes it's a lot easier of a sell to say like, hey, talk to someone for 30 minutes and we're going to release a short podcast episode versus prepare an academic speech and come speak at Penn. To an audience of your peers or whatever, yeah. Yeah, to an audience, exactly. I think it's a little bit of an easier sell sometimes to ask people to just sit down for an audio interview. I'm curious, you started this a few years ago because you sort of had this convergence of capacity and passion and a motivation to sort of replicate these great conversations that you were having in a live arena, but you've persisted. So do you all feel like you've been hitting all your goals of putting these conversations out there and framing DH in this context of access and intersectionality? I think yes and no. I will say that I didn't come from an audio production background and I find myself continuously being humbled by what an undertaking it is to make a good podcast that really reflects the quality of what the speakers are bringing to the situation. Whether or not we've hit all of our goals, I am tempted to say probably not, but it's a learning process in making it. I feel like we're constantly learning and we're kind of figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And it's an understatement to say that COVID was disruptive, right? It's been a completely paradigm shifting scenario. And that touched this as well. <laughs> I really liked the audio booth we used to meet in in the library. And it was really great to just record and have everything set up. And now we're doing things very much at a distance. And, you know, it's been odd because I'm not even usually present for a lot of these recordings. They happen away. And so I'm coming in at a very different step along the process now. So it's been full of bumps and problems to be solved, but it's also been really fun. And I think what we're learning is that it's sustainable to do at a certain scale and that we have no shortage of interesting people that we want to ask to join us. People have been very generous with their time in terms of agreeing to do it. I was really surprised when I looked at the SoundCloud page for the podcast to see that some of these episodes were getting way more plays than I had imagined. For example, the interview I did with Wendy Chun, who's a historian and theorist of software, especially surrounding issues of race. I remember thinking, wow, how do people find this? Why are they listening to it? I mean, I know why they're listening to it, or I hope they do, because it's interesting. But I was excited to see that it was reaching more people than I had thought. 
The other thing I would add is that Sarah just mentioned a moment ago, the interruption of COVID. And at the time I was teaching my podcasting class through the Price Lab and that was interrupted. The students were going to do oral histories with people in Philadelphia who they had found. And then the projects had to go deeply inward. And some of them ended up doing things like radio diaries or just talking to intimate friends. One student ended up interviewing his father because they were living together and that's who he could be around. But the thing that was really cut off too was the Price Labs summer camp essentially, which is the dream lab where people get a kind of crash course in digital humanities. And Sarah and a bunch of my students brought the dream lab that had been canceled to a podcasting format. And that was really amazing that they managed to do that. What's dream lab? I saw on the podcast page, there was like older entries that said dream lab, but that sounds like it's a specific concept for you. Yeah, I think Julie summed it up really well in terms of saying that it's sort of a summer camp-like experience. It's a training camp where people who are scholars in digital humanities or people who work in adjacent fields or are interested in learning and exploring more and gathering some new tool sets or skills, I should say, come to Dream Lab. And it's a week-long institute held at the University of Pennsylvania. Dream is an acronym. It stands for Digital Resources and Methods. So the RE of dreams is from the resources. <laughs> We're really trying to make that work. Well, Dram Lab, everybody would want to come up and start <laughs> drinking. <laughs> yeah, I think once you're in academia for more than a couple months, you realize that there is a true preponderance for acronyms. But Dream Lab is great, and it's just a really fun experience. And we were really sad when the university decided to put that on pause. It's a little bit of a bummer, but we have all these folks lined up who wanted to teach. They know what they were going to talk about. We pitched the idea to them, and they were like, oh, yeah, that'd be great. So in a very quick succession, <laughs> we recorded and edited several episodes. And like Julie said, I had the great pleasure of working with her students, and they were just fantastic and did really excellent audio work. It was somewhat collaborative. You know, I helped them cut a bit, but mostly that was work that the students were taking on. And it made a situation that was stressful and sad really fun to kind of be able to come together and work with these brilliant students to produce something kind of cool that we could share with a wider audience. Some of the courses are like Afrofuturism and they talk about community archives and text analysis. There's just so many different things that get covered at Dream Lab. So it was really fun to do a little mini series about it. For us, we were recording in person at the KUNM Fancy Recording Studios prior to the pandemic. So now the pandemic hits. And so we had to pivot in a technological way, figure out a way to do distance recording. But ironically, it was something that we wanted to do anyway, because we had guests that we wanted to talk to that were so far away geographically that there would be no way to record them in person. And because we were forced to figure out ways to do this virtually, one of the silver linings has been it's really broadened who we can talk to in a way that's relatively easy. Have you all seen that a little bit or do you mostly focus on people who are more directly in the UPenn academic ecosphere as it were? Yeah, I think there has been some truth to that. We recently featured Thomas Padilla, the Director of Information Systems and Technology Strategy at the Center for Research Libraries, joined us. He was able to have a really interesting conversation with Dr. Jennifer Garcon, who works at the Penn Libraries, and that happened at a distance. We're really grateful that that conversation could take place between those two scholars. One thing I'll say briefly is that while Stuart Barner, the Managing Director, does do a lot of the interviews we also try to curate the podcast a bit so that we're teaming people up. Our fellows from the research seminar will often talk to the guests or different scholars who we want to have in. So it's a bit of a matchmaking process to see who might want to discuss these concepts together. And just as a note too, um, Julie, I don't remember, when was the official end of your fellowship date with Price? April 2020. <laughs> April 2020. Yeah, oh. so Julie teaches at the new schools. It ended abruptly with COVID. You know, we didn't come back from spring break. And my fellowship was supposed to continue on into the summer. And I was really excited to do Dream Lab again. And I finished out the rest remotely. 
I still get sad when I think about it. But this is to say, even though the technical fellowship date was over in April because of COVID, Julie worked with us throughout the summer on the Dream Lab podcast. Julie is a professor at the New School now, and her fellowship is no longer ongoing with the Price Lab. So while she was with us, she helped birth the podcast and get it going with us very generously. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. I just want to say one little thing at the beginning of this segment for our listeners, which is part of what spurred me and Ellen to want to do this particular program at this time, is this is our 24th program. We are coming up on two years of doing our own digital humanities-based podcast. And we thought it would be fun to do a digital humanities podcast about digital humanities podcasting. (laughs) So I'm sort of curious over the past couple of years that you all have been doing this podcast, what issues do you see evolving and what issues do you feel like we're getting stuck on? Something I just observed in the tiers that I was at the Price Lab, it just seems that the question is emerging, what is digital humanities? And Of course, there was this moment when we thought maybe it was going to save the humanities and the humanities are still in peril. But one of the things I really respect about the podcast is its continued emphasis upon race and intersectionality. To me, it seems like that's where DH is really going. If it's going to go anywhere, those are recurring issues that come up. Because I think before there was some kind of retrograde notions that technology, especially DH, could achieve a kind of neutrality or objectivity. In a way, it was kind of a throwback to certain enlightenment ideals. And one thing I've always appreciated about the Price Lab and with it, the podcast, is that they've never been seduced by those myths. They've always been pushing these areas of race and gender, ethnicity, nation, the archive, the city, the community. Just to get a term definition for the listener that might not have any idea what we're talking about, you said race and intersectionality. When I say intersectionality, I am drawing from Black feminist traditions, and these are scholars who have emphasized the extent to which race, gender, and class cannot be separated from each other. That, you know, if you're talking about race, you're always also talking about gender and class and vice versa. I'm curious to hear you all talk about the way that some of the DH scholars have been driving these discussions about the data is not neutral. That's one of the discussions that I see trickling through to a much larger realm. Did all those discussions start out of the digital humanities? These discussions are really driven by the scholars that are being brought to the Price Lab. Sarah, in partnership with Stuart Varner and Jim English, continue to bring people who are asking these kinds of questions. These questions are foundational to what the Price Lab is about. One of the things they've always been asking is, what is the digital humanities? And maybe it's not as limited as we think. That's what makes it such an exciting place that intersects with so many different types of scholars. 
Do you see the digital humanities field changing and becoming more inclusive or changing in its overall approaches beyond Price Lab? Absolutely, especially since the publication of books like Safia Noble's Algorithms of Oppression and Jesse Daniels' works on racism and chat rooms and the non neutrality of the internet as a virtual space. These questions are now at the fore of what DH scholars are doing. The other thing that DH scholars are doing, and I wouldn't have known this had I not participated in the Price Lab is certain kinds of reparative work. For example, Alex Gilles at Columbia, who works connecting people who are incarcerated to digital technology and helping them to create Twitter bots. And so thinking, what's the bare minimum that you need in order to do digital work? And how can we begin there rather than thinking about maximalism? How can we get that out to people? So this kind of community building dimension and repair dimension of DH, that's something that was really exciting to me that I learned about through participating in the Price Lab that I wouldn't have known about before. I think that one of the ideas behind the podcast is we wanted to share the way that we think about DH particularly. So that really informed who we're having on and what kind of discussions we're having. And it seems fair to say that the Price Lab is very much desirous to see more DH that's really focused on questions of race, questions of equity. That's the sort of work that we're inspired by. We're inspired by work that really engages in these questions around equity and race and reparative work. Most of the people that we talk to are not working in academe. So they might be artists, or they might be working for a museum, or they might be archivists. But the same themes always come up. What drives their work is expanding access, making information available to the people who need it. Collaboration turned into a surprisingly consistent theme. None of us can do this work on our own that part of doing this work is learning to build and work with your team. And so I was curious whether you all see themes emerging besides the racism and intersectionality and how it impacts how we understand our history or our literature or whatever. It was really about how to bring that very exciting discussion to potentially hundreds of people one of the hallmarks of academia is that it's cloistered. You know, you have to have your ID card to get into the building. You have to have the email address to even get the invite. And the podcast becomes a perfect opportunity to get those discussions out there. I know that doesn't directly answer your question, but it's what it makes me think of. No, I think it does. And I guess if you don't mind revisiting is talking a little bit about how you involve students and then different interviewers, because that is a kind of a collaboration. If you put a librarian with a librarian, they're going to talk about different things than you might ask a librarian or I might. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really great question because I think at the heart of all of this, when we are listening to podcasts or watching some media, right, you don't always see all the work behind it. You know, you don't always know how many people went into making a given product. (laughs) So I can say while I do a significant portion of editing, there are so many other people involved students who are collaborating on the podcast who come in to help with the first paper edits of an episode or perhaps even cut the episode or find musical interludes or sound effects or or kind of like are building audio storytelling elements into what we're doing. I think there's certainly a lot of feedback. Like I used to pass episodes to Julia on occasion to be like, hey, what do you think of this? Like, how is this sounding? You know, I don't have a technical background in audio production. So there were a lot of question marks for me just in terms of like, how loud should things be? <laughs> like, How many spaces should there be between, you know, sentences when people are talking? Like how to make it sound naturalistic and high enough quality that people will want to engage with it. It's certainly this whole thing has been a learning process. And I think Stuart is very hands-on. Our managing director 
he is often the person asking for folks to join us on the podcast and just saying like, hey, would you like to talk with us about your work? You know, and I think that's something that we're all very grateful for. And we are at a large institution. We're at a very well-funded institution. But that said, we have to make the decision to spend time and resource on this. I do quite a bit of things for the organization that has nothing to do with the podcast. You've been working overtime on the podcast. Yes. <laughs> you just kind of burn the midnight oil. I've been wondering about that sometimes. So I'm like, is Sarah getting paid for this? Yes, yes, I, I am getting paid for it. You know, but I'd say it does all come out in the wash. But it was something that we had to make a very critical decision at a certain point when we really realized, oh, creating a podcast actually is going to take a lot of labor. And part of my salary goes to that. That's like a very, I'd say, conscious decision to have part of our time be spent doing this. And I think that speaks to the importance that we feel it can have just in terms of creating outreach. That said, it is a bit of a niche, you could say, perhaps, <laughs> like what we're doing, but we'd really like it to reach a larger audience. And I hope to devote more time to that, to figuring out different outreach strategies and releasing this in all the different ways that it can be listened to. Right now, we're just on SoundCloud, you know, but we do plan on working with a student worker next year who will probably help edit the podcast. That's something that I usually teach the student to do, at least partially. It's a very pedagogically based process. <laughs> Like I'm learning, people are learning while they're doing it, which for me is great. I graduated from the new school where Julie teaches in media studies and production. So for me, this is just a lot of fun. I genuinely have a blast doing it. It's not exactly a theme, but we do ask everyone, what's your background? What made you want to get into this work? And that really has brought up quite a bit of interesting stories and material. And some folks, you know, it's a pretty like straight shot. They're like, oh, I've always wanted to be in academia. And you know, and other folks like Wendy Chun talked about starting off as a data scientist and how her very particular journey and having to deal with a violent episode at a university where she was studying in Montreal really shaped the way she thought about data and about the way people understood it. And that kind of led her to work that looks much more like what we were talking about now in terms of digital humanities. I really enjoy hearing the humanistic stories behind what led people to get into academia. And to be passionate and enthusiastic mm. about their chosen field, because yeah. we've certainly seen that. When the people are knowledgeable and enthusiastic, then my experience has been they're always articulate and interesting to listen to. I actually just want to ask one sort of detail thing. The New School, what is the New School? The New School is a university in New York City. And so I was visiting at Penn as a fellow. And so it was just kind of kismet that Sarah had also spent time at the New School. And so we were kind of fellow travelers who ended up meeting in Philadelphia. I just wanted to add that the students in my class who had no experience with radio or audio production, they just knew that they loved podcasting and wanted to participate in it. Sarah was so excited by some of the pieces that, if I'm not mistaken, some of them were featured on the SoundCloud page or they might be at some point. But what I noticed about the student pieces is how empowered they felt to use the medium to tell a story and to be in conversation with strangers. And that I think as young people, that was very empowering for them. But I think there is an intersection there with what Sarah was saying about what leads people into academia in that most people seem to have some sort of origin story of how they got into this that DH is really about telling stories and that it's a tool of narrative. And, you know, I'm a literature studies scholar, so I'm inclined to think of it that way. But I just think the storytelling aspect is really important to the podcast, but also to the student work and to what the scholars are doing. Yeah, absolutely. The podcast and the class have been capacious enough to facilitate stories that are critical of the institution. You know, there is a history of Penn being in what was once a Black neighborhood and issues of gentrification and urban renewal and 
those stories intersect with the campus in really powerful ways. And some of my students have wanted to tell those stories and they've been trying to use DH and podcasting to think critically about their own position as students and participants in this institution. That's so cool. For all that academia sometimes from the outside takes knocks, I actually always felt that's one of the things academia can be really good at is self-critique, a sometimes brutal self-critique. Absolutely. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. In an earlier segment, you talked about how you try to curate what you're doing and presenting. So how do you go about that? Do you have big brainstorming meetings? Is it just one person who just says, here, do it? What's that process look like? We generally have interviewers come in who are from the DH seminar at Penn that the Price Lab hosts. So oftentimes we're asking those people in the seminar if they're comfortable to come in and be a host and join us. And if they say yes, they're invited to come and talk. You know, obviously there's a sense of what kind of research and scholarly work a person is doing and how might that intersect with what the guest works on and whether or not it could be kind of like a productive conversation for the two folks. I would say that Stuart is a host in many ways because I think his voice is the one that you hear when you come on to the podcast. You know, he's always involved. If he's not actively interviewing someone, he's behind the scenes helping set up those guests. I definitely pitch people that I think might be interesting or topics that I think might be interesting. And if it makes sense, we had a scholar, Wendy Chun, on the podcast and I actually thought of inviting her because she was coming in to give a lecture at the Wolf Humanities Center, which is another center at Penn that I work for. So I work for both Price and Wolf. And I thought the work that Wendy does is really fantastic. And like, it might be something of interest for the Price Labs audience. One of the things that's cool about the podcast is that because most of the people who are being interviewed are scholars... These are people who are used to being in the classroom and used to lecturing, so they're used to addressing an audience. What goes along with that is usually more of a technical way of speaking. And so the podcast, I think, is an opportunity to speak more informally and casually about the things that they're really passionate about. The podcast is a nice way to bridge those different ways of speaking about something that the interviewee has a really deep and scholastic knowledge of, but to speak about it in a different way that exceeds the lecture form and the classroom form and the seminar. Do you coach the interviewers in trying to draw out what I guess are mostly academics in speaking maybe more in lay terms? And I'm thinking the way that I sometimes approach the subject material, which is sometimes asking the person to restate it in what I think of as plain English or explaining acronyms or terms that may be very familiar in an academic setting, but not always so familiar to the general public. One of the things that we did when we were first starting the podcast was we got going a list of questions that interviewees would be asked. And if I'm not mistaken, the questions included things that academics aren't usually asked, which is, how did you get interested in the thing that you're doing now? I think that kind of question automatically puts the person in a different mood and reaches them on a more personal level and they're invited to speak more biographically and therefore more informally about the things that really drive them. 
And so I think when you begin from that place, the conversation is just naturally going to unfold in a less technical way. With that in mind, Julie, how did you get into this career that you have now parlayed into so much success, at least from my outside perspective? <laughs> Yeah, I guess I am successful. That's kind of cool. I'm just one of those people who always just did my own thing and always just followed my own interests. And for me, one of my strongest early interests was music and sound. I wasn't interested in music in a very formalist sense. I didn't want to study scores and compositions and notes. I was interested in the culture around music, and that led me to an interest in technology. So very early on, I was studying the history of sound technology, phonographs and radios. And as the technology evolved, my interests evolved into the digital. And when I was working on my PhD, I kind of took a little bit of an unapproved hiatus from writing my dissertation and enrolled in a class on radio journalism, which was how I learned how to use Pro Tools and how to interview people. And I started making kind of meta pieces in that journalism class about sound technology. And my first little piece was about a music store in Mill Valley, California, Village Music, that was going out of business. And they had focused on vinyl and they had just impacted the history of American music in a really deep way. And that piece was my midterm for the class, but it ended up getting picked up by NPR and winning an award. So I was like, okay, I'm on to something here. So yeah, I just kind of kept following those interests. And as the technology changed, my interests changed along with it. And so that's why teaching this class and podcasting came along and then collaborating with Sarah on the Price Lab podcast. Like a sort of perfect apotheosis of all of that. Exactly. And so, Sarah, what about you? How did you drift or intentionally drill right into your given career? My interests are definitively multivariate. I was an educator, actually. I did youth media education for over a decade in Baltimore, Maryland. And so I've always really been interested in learning media and understanding media and kind of exploring what you can do with it. That also gave me this ethos that I'm like, well, you can learn how to do something. Like you don't have to feel as if it's an impenetrable medium. You can actually just pick it up and figure it out, you know, a little bit as you go along <laughs> is how I describe my process. I have a little bit more of a background working in video production. Like I've done commercial video work, oftentimes for nonprofits or for the city of Philadelphia. So I have more of a background in video than I do sound. For me, it was like a really interesting experience to come to this medium. And I just have so much to learn. And I was really grateful that Julie was there to be very generous. <laughs> Part of it was just us wanting to think about different ways we could reach a wider audience or any audience just to share what we're doing. And we had talked about video, but it was just too labor intensive for what I could do and what my job as an admin would allow me to do. So that's sort of how I ended up doing this. And I'm very grateful that it worked out. And, you know, I've been inspired. I study coding now. I'm actually studying computer programming and web development. So that's something that directly came out of me doing this podcast and learning about these things that I was like, wow, there's so much potential, you know, and people are doing such interesting things. And I come from not a technical humanities background, but from a media studies background. And I also fine arts, you know, I have a degree in fine arts as well. So for me, this was like a really interesting place to land. It makes sense in a way. I'm grateful to be able to do it. The coding, were you inspired by like a guest or just the needs of the program? I'm curious. I think in part because I update our websites. I could just learn HTML and CSS, but I want to learn Python and go a little deeper. So right now I'm learning more robust languages or more high level languages, but I'm, you know, I'm also studying HTML and CSS. I, as an educator, I think I just love the pedagogical experience and I love to be learning all the time and just figuring out what else I can do. And I've done documentary filmmaking and I see kind of different forms existing online and there's different ways that you can approach that. And so part of this is also just for my own practice as an artist to see like what else I can do. It's sort of the jack of all trades, master of none problem, but, like, but I like to dabble. That sentiment always bothered me because I think you can be a master of all trades, but maybe that's just my own drift of constantly trying to know. learn and pick up skills. Yeah. 
I think the saying is jack of all trades and mastery is beside the point because the technology is evolving all the time. There you go. I'll take that. That's also a very circular way of coming back around to the different guests that you end up having on your particular program. Do you try to have a mix of very straight academics and maybe people that are more on like the technology side? And I don't know if this is a good comparison, but sometimes we have people who are very much new humanities or digital humanities. Like we had a guest that runs the Native American comic book store and publishing house in Albuquerque. And he's been archiving and putting online all of these Native American conceived and drawn comic books. But that's sort of straight humanities. But then we've also had people that are doing sort of cutting edge work in collecting what they may call community archives, where they're trying to do digital captures of audio, video, oral histories, and then put them online in these sort of searchable meta databases. So do you also try to get that kind of mix? I can just say briefly that everybody is an academic for the most part. Our uh, managing director, Stuart Barner, has a background as a librarian, or he got a degree in library science. So he really brings in a lot of people from that sphere as well. And so it's a lot of folks who work in the digital humanities, but in the academic context. I would add to that that there are some people who bring an activist dimension to their academic work where they're deeply motivated in their scholarly work by their activist interests. I'm thinking, for example, of Jesse Daniels, who I had the opportunity to interview on the podcast. And in a way, it's almost secondary that she's an academic. And I think Stuart, for example, really wants to connect the Price Lab to ongoing issues that shape the communities in Philadelphia. And so a big part of that is activist work and also the history of Philadelphia as an urban center and just the different politics and ecologies that shape the life worlds of Philadelphia, both today and in the past. So I think naturally you have people who are academics, but they're not just purely theoretical in their thinking. That's the better question to ask in this context. Like there's work that's what I think of as strictly academic and theoretical, but then there's work in academe that is much more practical. I'm really curious because we've had guests that in a way are digital humanities activists. What does that look like? Because I think when listeners hear these kind of connections to the community, I think it can be very resonant for the listener and for the community as a whole. So are there other examples of that or other guests that you've had where that's really been resonant? Before you had talked a little bit about Alex Jill and the minimalist computing and working with marginalized communities to do less, I mean, to do more with less. Yeah, I love that work. And I can't remember if I gave this example before, but he works with incarcerated people, teaching them how to make Twitter bots and how to be able to access Twitter and in a general way, but just to be able to do digital work from within these incarcerated spaces where they can't access very much technology. And Alex also worked in projects in the wake of different hurricanes in the Caribbean and ways of using the digital humanities in order to map what was happening there and also create networks where people could actually connect others with resources there. Did he work on that project where they went down and they were getting oral histories from people so that they could better advocate for services and relief efforts for these communities? Because there were a lot of narratives of, well, we sent them aid or whatever. Everything's fine now. And so they were going and getting these stories and sort of elevating these voices so that they could really target different communities that had been overlooked in some of the hurricane relief efforts. I don't think that that was the project that he worked on, but it's resonant with that kind of work. I'm also thinking of the historian at Penn who works in the history of redlining, and he's done some mapping projects just to show the impact of quote unquote urban renewal in Philadelphia. And so that project comes to mind too, being able to make visible the kind of devastating effects of urban renewal on communities. Just amazing. You're listening to Augmented Humanity. We'll be back in just a minute.
Welcome back to Augmented Humanity. Thank you so much for coming on our podcast to talk about your podcast. In this episode, we tend to talk about optimal tools and best practices. Since one of the missions of your podcast is to sort of elevate underrepresented voices, how do you take that into account when you're prepping or when you're teaching students or getting ready for a podcast, getting the guest ready, or with a set of questions that you use? How do you sort of thoughtfully make sure that your podcast is a safe space for these underrepresented scholars? I don't want to claim that we're doing it perfectly because I think it's definitely a learning process for most people to be more considerate and more thoughtful. It's funny because I'm kind of bifurcating this experience of the podcast in my mind a little bit into two halves and there's the before COVID and post COVID because they're very different production wise. Pre-COVID, we were meeting together in a recording booth at Penn. I believe I was sharing questions with people in advance, <laughs> you know, with guests in advance. I sure hope I was. If I wasn't, you know, I was trying to give it to them and a little bit of time to read over it and think through things. Generally speaking, I think I would email guests a rough outline of what we would be discussing so they wouldn't feel surprised or they'd have a chance to say, eh, I don't know about that question, but I'd rather talk about this. You know, because it's not an interrogation, it's a conversation, you know, so we really want to make sure that people feel ready and knowledgeable about what they're going to be talking about. It's not very formal. There's a set of questions, but I oftentimes have seen people deviate from that, you know, and kind of just ask follow-up questions or just go with the flow of where the conversation is going and really kind of listen to the guest and see what they might have to bring to the table. I do feel it's important to say that while not everybody that comes to the podcast is someone that Stuart is familiar with or that folks that are interviewing are familiar with, oftentimes there's some kind of connectivity, professional friendship or otherwise. And I think that that also lends itself to feeling like a pretty comfortable environment. Like I know during this COVID period, Stuart has been doing a lot of the recordings over Zoom. And I've noticed that there's something about the joy of people seeing each other and talking about something that they're passionate about. Even if it's on Zoom, it's just a conversation and it's usually pretty friendly and relaxed. I would also say the Price Lab's viewpoint on creating safe spaces and trying to be good allies and really being more critical of that, that's evolving in step with our wider society evolving around those thoughts. And I think it's something that I've just seen change. What happens in the podcast is a microcosm of what happens at the Price Lab the ways in which people think about the learning space or the space being open and welcome and safe for people is something that is writ large for Price Lab. You know, I'm a white person, Stuart is a white person, not everybody on staff is white, but I think as we too are oftentimes working on this, I would welcome feedback from people and I wouldn't expect it, but if they ever were like, hey, this is how this could be done differently, I would hope that that could be a learning moment for everybody and say like, yeah, you know, that makes sense, we'll do that. I'll just add to that something that I've done this year on the heels of the Black Lives Matter uprisings that I had never done in class before is write community agreements, you know, where you decide amongst each other, how are you going to treat each other? What's important to you as a small community? And there have been moments since writing those community agreements where we had to go back to it and say, hey, one of our members has kind of infracted upon this or is not living up to this. Let's take a moment to address what happened and actually just allowing a little bit of time for that discussion, which is extra academic, extra scholarly. It's not about the book that's in front of you. It's not about the material you're discussing that day, but it's nevertheless the fiber of what it means to be together talking. And this is a generation of students who have been growing up with podcasts and growing up with this new conversational medium in a way that terrestrial radio has never been. I mean, talk radio is mostly pretty scripted and podcasting is really about letting it all hang out there. 
That's a great approach. And I can see how it would translate well from the classroom to a more intimate conversational setting. And it just echoes Sarah's point that it is a learning process. From the get-go, you're saying we're going to talk about uncomfortable things that happened rather than just scolding them or sweeping it under the carpet, then you actually have the opportunity to learn from it. I would have never thought of doing this, by the way. I should give a big shout out to the program of civic engagement and social justice at my university that distributed a bunch of resources, how to make these agreements, because I never would have known. I would have never been able to figure it out. We spoke about this before, where we had students coming in and working on the podcast. And we obviously did that with Julie's students, which was fantastic. These students had a variety of backgrounds. It was great to come have them produce content. You know, it really allowed for a variety of takes on the subject matter of digital humanities to kind of come out. I'm not sure if I've mentioned this yet, and it's huge. I've been working with a student worker, Maria Chiameso da Silva. She and I worked really closely together on the podcast this past year. There's no way I could have done it without her work on this because, you know, she's fantastic. And also, as I've mentioned, I'm an admin. I do a lot of different things. So Kia was there editing transcripts and co-producing episodes with me. So I really feel like that's something I don't want to lose. Kia's perspective was really wonderful, and I'm glad that I had that. She's from a different generation than I am. She's of a different racial background. I think there's just a lot going on there where her voice, her presence in that added to the process, and I was very grateful for it. So I think that's also part of it too, right, is thinking about who's producing it and who's actually taking part in having a say in what material is getting shared. Because we cut down a lot. Sometimes I ask people to only record 30 minutes, you know, or like 40 minutes because I'm doing like a 15 to 20 minute podcast. So there's a lot that we have to choose. You know, it's a lot about choosing. And it's sort of interesting because I'm not an academic. The students that I work with are getting a very rigorous academic training, you know, but they're not at the scholarly level yet, or they're not quite perhaps ready to step into the mantle of being a scholar, however you want to describe that. So it's interesting that we're the ones that are doing a lot of the choice making in terms of what goes out on this podcast. And I think that says something about the material too, and that it's not only technological talk. There's a lot of just sort of more interesting interpersonal narratives and information about the scholarship that manages to be translated. Something that you both said that really struck me personally is talking about the students grew up with podcasting. And it's something that I get intellectually, but I realize I can't really get it. So I'm really curious about those varied perspectives on this process and this medium. You're talking about undergrads, is that right? When you both say students, you're talking about undergrads? Do they like things to be faster and more edited with more music, or is it just a different sort of take on what is interesting? I don't know if it can generalize. Well, the thing that struck me teaching this new generation of students, and I identify as Gen X, I say I identify as because I'm kind of on the cusp between generations. But the thing that strikes me about this younger generation is the sense of a desire to put their voices in a medium and to disseminate their Mm. voices and to be in conversation with other people and that they have podcast heroes and all of them were podcasts that I had never heard of because... I grew up with traditional terrestrial radio, and so my radio knowledge was about the people who were putting what had already been terrestrial programs onto the internet, you know, things like This American Life that already had this really long history, but they're listening to things that are born digital. And mostly what they are drawn to are about regular people who are not famous, getting together around a microphone, talking about the things that matter to them. And I would have a show and tell every week where a student would bring in a podcast that they were listening to and talk about what they thought was great about it, what they thought worked about it. And every week I was just kind of blown away by 
not only how many podcasts were out there, but how interesting they are. And so I think that's really driving this new generation of listeners. They want to put their voices out there too. They want to be part of the dialogue and the technology is right at their fingertips. They can post things on SoundCloud. They can use GarageBand. Craig, you mentioned a moment ago that when you used to cut, you had to literally cut, you know, which meant you actually had to have some difficult to learn technical skills. I was a video major in college, actually, and I was still doing tape where you're doing linear editing, where if you make a mistake, you have to go back and like start over, basically. <laughs> So anyways, this is just to say that they seem to sense that there's this ongoing conversation, a polyphony of voices, and they want to be a part of it. Not like, oh, there's this sanctified host and maybe one day I'll get to be their intern. That's not what they're interested in. <laughs> that universe doesn't exist anymore, really, I think. No, no. That's fascinating. Yeah, I think it does exist, right? But it's almost like we have this layered, like if you think of it, like the media landscape is just like very layered because terrestrial radio is still there. People still listen to it, you know? So it's interesting, but you'll dig deep and there's just so much out there. So it's fun to be with the young ones <laughs> and be like, hey, cool kids, what are, you, <laughs> what are you doing now? As I think the term that just came out this week for my generation, my micro generation is a geriatric millennial. I was like, really? All right, that's cool. <laughs> that's cool. So I'm a geriatric millennial, so I definitely enjoy being on a campus with young people. Well, this has just been a wonderful, for me anyway, a joyable discussion. I could talk to you both for hours about all this stuff because it's just so interesting what you're doing. Yeah, and everybody listening should like and subscribe to the Price Lab podcast. You can find it on SoundCloud. With that in mind, is there anything, Sarah, Julie, that you would like to add that is really that kind of promotional plug for the work that you're doing? This is the nitty gritty. For now, we're only on SoundCloud. But this summer, one of my summer projects is going to be to get us on all of the platforms, on all the channels. You know, as an academic center, the summer is a very different time for us. You know, and Dream Lab is happening, but it's completely virtual. So check us out on SoundCloud and you can find our website, which is pricelab.sas.upenn.edu or we're on Twitter at, at Penn Price Lab. So oftentimes I post there information about the podcast. Thank you both so much. This was just such a treat. Yeah, thank you. It's a thrill to discover your podcast and it's just a thrill to talk to you. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you. And if you would like more information about the Price Lab podcast, you can visit pricelab.sas.upenn.edu slash podcast or look up the Price Lab podcast on SoundCloud. Augmented Humanity is a program of the New Mexico Humanities Council produced in partnership with KUNM FM. You can visit us online and find out more about our programs at nmhumanities.org. Our theme music comes courtesy James Whiten, and we've had production assistance from Tristan Klum.